So before I get started, a couple of small disclaimers. Uh, first off, this is not just a Lenovo talk. I'm going to be talking about some things that involve Lenovo, but I don't want anybody coming back at me or talking to my boss and saying, Jason McQuiggan said we're all going to be cyborgs in five years or anything ridiculous, because we're going to talk about some far-reaching things. So I want to make sure we talk about that. Uh, second of all, I'm overdoing slides. <laughs> so I know if we asked many of you in this room what your job is, you might say your job is making PowerPoint slides, because there's so much of our time that gets absorbed in that. And I'm not here to try and convince you of something, so I wanted to do this in a more of a storytelling fashion. And I loved seeing Vicky's talk just now, because it really brings to bear a lot of the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about, is how to tell better stories, because they relate directly to how our customers can actually use this technology. And I want to do something different. So once I get started on my third slide, um, there's no stopping. It's one full running piece. I'm going to talk through it. And if I get stumbled, so be it. We are where we are. But we're going to be showing visuals that will be representative of what I'm talking about without going through the normal slides. First, a little personal business. Uh, I've got a nice tan because I just came back from my honeymoon. So this is me and my beautiful wife from uh, our wedding about three weeks ago. The uh, reason that's important and why I brought that up is because I was busy doing other things up until about a week ago, and I decided, oh, I really got to get started on this presentation when I came back. But it gave me a full reset on the topic I'm talking about today because it really is about the reality that we paint for ourselves and, and how we move into this future reality that we're all building together. And the people in this room are so, so important to that. So without further ado, let's jump into the actual presentation. We can start that now. And I don't know if you guys can make that side screen full screen, but please feel free. But the question really here is, what is reality? Now, is it something simply that we interact with in the world, something that makes up from our senses? But throughout this talk, I'm going to continue to ask you yourself to ask yourself that question. What is your reality? And everyone has their own definition because it's uniquely important to each one of us. Our personal description and perception of reality is tied to our sights, our sounds, everything that we do as an individual. So what constitutes that totality of reality? When we look at that, all those individual pieces, do we have to take up every single person in this room? The reason it's so important is because we're here at a conference called you know, Augmented World Summit, or oh, sorry, Augmented World Expo, and it's about XR. The idea of extended reality assumes that we have a version or a singular truth about what reality really is. You throw in that massive wild card around XR, or AI rather, and things are going to get very weird very, very soon. When we talk about XR, we're usually talking about how we enhance something about our sights, our sounds. But when we get to the very near real future, we're bringing those devices closer to our bodies means it's going to augment our senses on a regular basis. It's not just about something you wear. It's about contextually how much you're going to accept this impacting the way you interact with the world. So as you walk through this, and as we see these sometimes familiar and sometimes unique and new novel videos, you have to continue to ask yourself, what is your reality? And when technology evolves to that point where you can no longer distinguish between a digital and the real world, Will that reshape the way you walk through the world? Will it reshape your human perception? Those are the things that I'm going to be asking you to contemplate today. So in my space in Lenovo, I am the global head of XR commercialization. What does that mean? I used to be the head of virtual reality, but our whole plan, our whole agenda, our whole team, everything's expanded. We're looking at this from a much broader approach. The entire XR world is evolving because of AI, and we're here for it. We're along for that ride. But within the commercialization, I look at ROI. And that's not just for us, but for how each individual customer, how each person that utilizes this technology gets value out of it. And as it evolves, I want you to come by our booth, talk to us about what we're doing with our good friends over at Meta, what we're doing around the partners that we're bringing into the space, because we really look at ourselves as that connective tissue across the industry how we're bringing all these folks together to create comprehensive solutions. But prior to my time at Lenovo, I've been in XR for about 12 years, but prior to that, uh, I was in the interactive media world and film. 
So I have a deep appreciation for media as a whole. And that's allowed me to take advantage of some of these new AI tools to create visions of the world and visions of things that I'm trying to communicate in amazing new ways. It allows for experimentation that would have cost time, money, eons, eons of time. And as you can see on screen, I'm able to experiment with telling a story, sharing a vision of a reality to come. Now, maybe not the dystopian dune landscape we're seeing here, but something that's going to show you that there's real power in these tools that are, that's impacting our technology today. And as we use these to impact what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, does it change the skills that we need to move throughout the world? Does it change our individual aspects that change who we are as, person, as a person? So as we do that, we have to look at the people that adopt the technology and the people that don't as a potential divide. And you have to ask yourself, where will you fall on that spectrum? First, cyborgs, of course, a uh, very important one. So I did mention we'd be talking about cyborgs, but really the definition of a cyborg really is that it's a human that's been upgraded by a mechanical device. Now, many of us in that room already, in this room already qualify. You know, you've got your eyeglasses. Now, your glasses qualify as something that's augmenting your way to see the world. Now, when I put my glasses on, the world didn't get more clear. I see the world as blurry, but when I take my, put my glasses on, it becomes more clear. It didn't change the world. It changed my perception of it. So when you look at it from that perspective, how different is a pair of augmented reality glasses? It's allowing you to see things that you wouldn't be able to see with your normal flawed biology alone. Everything from pacemakers, eyeglasses, hearing aids, all these devices we're so used to being commonplace work with us to create a different perception of the world. And it's inevitable that the advance of this technology, and as we continue to move forward, will get closer and closer to our bodies. It'll become more integrated, both from a use perspective and the devices themselves. Soon we'll be you know, routinely augmenting our sights and sounds, so much so that it will become commonplace. You know, Vicky's talk was fantastic to have a precursor here, because if you saw that, you see that she had a bond she created with a digital being. You know, those sensory inputs, those memories create the fabric of who we are as people. And of course, this space here is how we see this happening. XR and AI in this space, this room, the people here at this conference are the ones creating this. So starting with something simple that we already are familiar with, you, persistent objects. That persistence and that spacing happens a lot because of the technology behind XR, but also the technology that's enabled through AI. You put a piece of digital artwork on the wall, your digital pet, all exactly where you left them. Now, excuse me, persistence will make digital objects feel tangible. If those objects do not stay where they are, then there's a high likelihood that we will lose our connection with them. Now, we're already seeing this with the devices out there today, but that level of permanence that we're getting will continue to evolve. When you start adding contextual ideas, walking into a room and understanding everything is in its place, knowing everyone's names, never forgetting a thing, these are not abstract ideas. We're seeing this done with wearables today. Now, a friend of mine recently tried the Meta Ray-Ban glasses, and he remarked something Extraordinary, but simple. He said, you know, I wish they had a little display on them so I could see what I was looking at. Sorry, a little like, malfunction here. So he wanted to, to, to see what he was looking at or what the AI was telling him. And what we, he was describing was an XR device. Now, that's common for us here, but it's leaking out into the general populace. And you layer on all the enhancements we could put in there, and you, you start to create superpowers. You want to find your keys, your dog, your friend at a busy stadium. You could see across miles. You could see through walls. It begins to sound like Superman. It doesn't seem crazy to be able to do that. And you start looking at what's going on with more advanced technologies, brain-computer interfaces. We're already seeing them become less intrusive and more useful. So we're bordering on telepathy. Now, it sounds crazy, but that's really where the technology is leading us. 
With voice cloning tools and gesture technology, I can guarantee that a few of you can probably go out in the, in the hallway and make me a prototype. This is not far-fetched. It's science fact, just early stage. And those that are equipped with this contextual information about the world, this ambient information, this ambient knowledge, will move through the world at different speeds. So it will create a separation between people that have this ability and people that do not. And I do believe that the people in this room will be the early adopters, people that will have these superhuman abilities. So we have to look at that from an overall global perspective, you know, the ethical aspects of the, the legislative aspects, but it's going to create a have and have nots. You know, as we dig deeper into this, the augmented humans are superhumans and the baseline people, will one group be inherently viewed as better than the other? Now, will society trust information more for people who have natural knowledge versus people that are augmented because they are fearful of where that information is being fed from? And it opens up numerous questions about what constitutes true intelligence. Will intelligence solely be the skill of expertly managing these technical systems? Or will we prioritize that natural intelligence that's organically retained and unassisted by technology? And you have to think about the implications for trust, education, and our interpersonal relationships. So let's talk about education as an example. Now, you can't just walk into a classroom with your laptop and open it up when you're taking a test, right? But what happens when you remove that barrier and that information is no longer on a computer? It's within your senses, it's within your head. You're gonna tell every student to walk into a classroom and remove their glasses because now every student has smart glasses? You know, think of your phones. Of course, everybody has a smartphone now. There's no dumb phones left here, right? So you can't get to a real world scenario where this isn't penetrating every aspect of the devices we use today. And that digital divide could breed additional aspects of envy, resentment, potentially even fear. So that ethical and legislative and legal guidelines will be important, but you know collectively as a society we're not great at that. But personally, I absolutely lean towards optimism and I encourage everyone to do so as well. Because I believe by actively emphasizing the positive outcomes here, we inherently help mitigate the negatives. We're driving towards that future where we're continuously building the positive. My personal hope and genuine belief is that these technologies could significantly uplift society and ultimately create this force within the world that, profound, that, that creates profound philosophical changes and differences with the way we interact with one another. And of course, it will absolutely affect the way we evolve as a species. We are no longer just a biological species overall, we're moving forward with these technical aspects as core aspects of who we are. So why do I care about that? Why am I even, you know, coming to this from the Lenovo perspective? Well, we have a very broad, far-reaching goal, smarter technology for all, and more specifically, AI for all. And embedded in that mission is a commitment to equitable access. It's our responsibility to help ensure that everyone has access to our technology or to these technologies because we create the tech that actually ends up in people's hands every single day. You take XR for example. Now it's an endpoint technology. It's something that ends up on your face. It's what you see, but it's not necessarily what does the heavy lifting. Now the tech has to be smaller, lighter, cheaper, better. In order to get there, we're gonna have to continuously move the compute off the device. So we'll be looking at connectivity, edge compute, every aspect of that chain that Lenovo already plays in. So again, we play a vital role within this connective aspect. Our strength isn't in any one single component, it's taking the whole system together and bringing it into products that end up in people's hands. And it's because we touch so many parts of that technology stack, that's really important that we make sure everyone has access to it. And while we're making real progress on our own, we recognize that, oh, that's a big change. We, we recognize that we cannot do it alone. Mike is feeling good. So collaboration is key, and we are, of course, working with major partners like Meta Analyst. I don't know if we can pause this for a second. Sorry. Pause that, guys.
Can everyone hear me if I just speak really loud? There we go, okay, all right, sorry about that. So what you're seeing here, and the idea behind this was taking the elephant in the room around AI. And now one of the big challenges, of course, with AI is keeping up with it. It is absolute chaos right now because the technology to create the things I've created up here on screen did not exist two years ago. I would have spent my entire budget that I used to create this presentation on a single Getty stock video if this were real video. But all this was created by one person you know, in my office at home over the course of about eight or nine hours this weekend. The power of this tech is unimaginable and it is entirely, entirely unpredictable. So the timelines for this traditional aspects are out the window. We used to think of how AI moves rapidly or how, how we move through the world and unaugmented by AI, AI changes that timeline. We used to have to deal with what we refer to as generational knowledge, where we rely on what was created in the past to build the future. AI can leapfrog through that. We're no longer waiting for the steam engine to become the bullet train. AI can simulate that overnight. And when I first entered this field, it felt like we were moving on a treadmill because we always knew exactly where we were going. You put one foot in front of the other and you know the exact direction you're going. It felt steady and safe. But now it's much more like a trampoline. You jump on and you're propelled higher and higher every time. But every leap has a level of unpredictability. You're not quite sure exactly where you're gonna land. So as we close this out, before I lose any more mics, <laughs> we have to look at the possibility of where all this is taking us. And asking yourself that question that we started with, what is reality? As we think of it, we're on the cusp of a revolution that is not just philosophical and emotional and technical, but absolutely world changing. And it's going to become profoundly individualized, something that we cannot entirely predict personalization of this really comes down to the people in this room because you are not the audience. You are the authors of this. As you're building this, you have to continuously ask yourself why and what you're doing because you're not building it just for us. You're building it for the billions of people that are not in this space. That sounds lofty, but when we see examples of what you know, ILM is doing right now, it's here. We're not thinking far in the future. We're thinking about how we're going to get this more broadly spread. It's just about scale at this point. And these technologies are just not about being tools. They'll become intimately woven into every fabric of our society and our person. So the values and intentions you put into the things you work on absolutely matter. So as you move forward, ask yourself that question. What is reality to me? And more importantly, what is the shape of the reality you want to create for the world? Thank you.